to today's uh, NEC webinar. My name's Jennifer Patel and I'm the Business Support Officer for Seeker based in Yorkshire and the Humber. So it might be um, that I've not met anybody. I've only been in the business just under a month now. Uh, so hello uh, and welcome to you all. Uh, we're very grateful to Sarah Wilson of Bevan Britain who will be delivering today's session. Now, you should all be able to access the chat function. Um, if somebody could be kind enough to write in there just to let us know that you can see and hear us, that would be great. If somebody can just, oh, excellent. Thank you, Ryan. Um, and to those who registered initially on Click Meeting, thank you again for registering on Microsoft Teams. So we're looking to move our webinars over from Click Meeting to Microsoft Teams in order to improve compatibility for members because not everyone can access Click Meeting. Um, so today is the first webinar being run on Microsoft Teams. Um, and if this goes well, which I'm sure it will, then all future Click Meeting webinars will be moved onto Teams in due course. So you'll need to re-register for those, but if you can just wait to receive the registration link. Now, a copy of today's slides will be emailed to you after the session. Um, and we will be recording today's session. So if any of your colleagues would like to view it afterwards, uh, then just get in touch um, with myself for the link. Um, and if anybody requires a certificate to demonstrate CPD, then just drop me an email um, and I can produce a certificate for you and send it across. If you've got any questions for Sarah, then Sarah will be happy to answer these at the end of the session. So if you just want to add them into the chat as we're going through, I'll monitor the chat. And then at the end of the session, um, Sarah will be happy to answer those questions. So without further ado, I'm going to um, hand over to Sarah Wilson for today's session. Thank you. Afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you, Jennifer. Um, yes, so today's topic, we're looking at um, the NEC form of contract. And what we're doing today is a comparison between the engineering and construction contract, so the contract that hopefully um, most of you in the room today will be, will be familiar with, but we're doing a comparison um, with the NEC professional services contract. Um, now, so these are the key things that we're going to look at. Um, but basically what I'm going to be doing is highlighting the differences why I think that might be useful or why I hope it might be useful um, to you all is that you know, I assume that at some point um, you will be carrying out design work, which um, will probably mean that you will be engaging some design consultants and possibly be engaging them on an NEC professional services contract. Um, and in fact, if you're doing work under the NEC contract, the engineering and construction contract, yeah, I would definitely recommend using the professional services contract for your consultants. And really, I hope today's webinar will show why it's it's a fairly seamless um, contract to use if, assuming you are doing your work under the NEC engineering and construction contract. Now, before we start getting into the detail, what I would say is that the um, there's also a professional services short form contract. Um, the other thing is there are timescales in the same way as we have timescales under the engineering and construction contract. Um, the NEC professional services contract typically has the same timescales as we have under the engineering and construction contract. So that is one item that would probably need to be changed if you were going to use it, because clearly, for example, hopefully we all know that um, if you're notifying a compensation event under the engineering and construction contract, you have eight weeks to notify. Um, the consultant has the same period of time under the professional services contract. So clearly you would want the professional, the consultant to be notifying you, say, within six weeks. So you then have um, two weeks to notify up the chain to your client. So just bear that in mind. 
So what we're going to look at today, um, we're going to look at the pricing mechanisms, the X clauses that are available, CEs, compensation events, um, and the mechanisms for claiming them and also programming. So <clears throat> these are all the contracts contained within the NEC suite. So it's getting quite a long list now, which is good. Um, but you will see that I've highlighted in red the ones that we're talking about today. So the first four are basically the engineering and construction contract and subcontract and then the short form for each. And then the two um, further down professional services contract um, and the short form contract. What I would say is um, what we're looking at today is the PSC, the professional services contract, not the short form. And my inclination would be to use the PSC rather than the PSSC, except where um, the design work being carried out is, you know, a pretty low value. So, first of all, in terms of pricing mechanisms, what do we have under the PSC? So hopefully this clearly sets it out. So we've got options A to F, um, which hopefully you recognise as being um, the pricing options under the engineering and construction contract, or at least A to E. And you know how I kind of think about it is A is the kind of ultimate in fixed price. Um, and then it, it kind of goes down sort of incrementally till you get to E, cost reimbursable, where you basically paid for the work that you carried out, you've carried out plus the fee percentage for your OHP. And then we've got a variety of you know things in the middle, particularly with C and D, which are the pain gain um, target uh, contracts. So what do we have for the PSC? Well, we don't have the opportunity for all of these. And it's it's pretty obvious why. So we don't have option B because that's bill of quantities for obvious reasons, because this is a consultant's appointment. Um, and we don't have option D, which is the target cost with a bill of quantities, again, for obvious reasons. So again, still lots of options for the professional services contract. And I guess, you know, it's not beyond the realms of possibility that, you know, you might be doing work under, say, option A, and you agree that the consultant might um, do its contract works under option E. But I guess from a commercial perspective, it would be way better um, to be able to persuade the, the consultant to do it under option A. So you've got a fixed price um, rather than leaving things open. So, so that's that's the costing. So then if we go on to the um, main the main responsibilities. Um, so how we've how we've set this out is we've got NEC B e and C, so that's engineering and construction, and then NEC PSC to distinguish them. I think that's fairly obvious. Um, so this is under the main responsibilities section um, of the contract. Um, at clause two. So your contracts will provide that the contractor's responsibilities include providing the work, submitting particulars of design um, and of equipment, etc. Whereas, as you'd expect, the consultant's responsibilities include the provision of the service. Um, now, the service um, um, is typically set out in the service information. So the service information is the equivalent to um, the works information or in NEC for the scope. Um, so apart from that slight distinction, which you know is um, reflects the fact that the consultant isn't carrying out physical work on site. Um, the other clauses are all similar. They talk about cooperation, working with others, etc. Um, and you know, so so to a great extent, and this is why I said at the start, you know, I think if you're using the engineering and construction contract, you would use the professional services contract because you know it's it's they very much mirror each other insofar as is relevant. Um, 
in terms of um, time scales, so this is cause three um, of NEC. Um, so it covers for things like the takeover provisions. So that's at clause 35. Um, so in particular, it states that the, you know, in certain circumstances, the client, the employer need not take over the works before the completion date. Um, so particularly if the contract data states it's not willing to do so. Now, these provisions aren't included in the professional services contract because, again, there's no issue about takeover. Um, obviously, there is an issue about completion, but there's no takeover because takeover is the physical act of um, going on to site and taking over the physical works. Um, in terms of um, programming, the contracts are pretty similar, as you'd expect. Um, so, you know, the key point is that if the program isn't appended to the contract, then the first programme has to be submitted. So um, contractors have to submit it to its employer or its client, professional services contractor. Um, so the consultant has to submit it to you, you people, um, the contractor for approval. And the, the kind of indented bullet points set out um, all all the issues that both parties need need to include, so they mirror each other. And you know this this is you know a good example of why you know the contracts work well together, um, and why they should be used together. And also why you know as a contractor you are putting yourself in risk at, at risk if you sign up to a. Um, engineering and construction contract under NEC, but then you engage your consultants under a different form of contract because most um, other forms of standard um, professional services appointments um, and, you know, even the bespoke contracts that, you know, generally um, law firms, you know, have um, and that they can tailor to projects don't require this kind of detail from the consultant in terms of programming. Now, hopefully there won't be an issue in a project with um, consultants and the programmes, but, you know, if you do have issues, so typically um, either that, you know, the design isn't provided and it um, causes delay to the project or um, that the consultant claims that it hasn't been provided with information that it needed, um, which causes delay. You know, it's really important to have um, the dates when information design, etc., is required to be submitted um, so that, you know, those claims can either be proven or um, rejected clearly um, and without um you know, arguments as to when things should have been submitted to which party. So, you know, re and of course, you know, bear in mind that if, you know, the consultant is submitting a claim which you as contractor would want to submit up the chain, so circumstances where um, the client hasn't done something that they should have done, for example, um, which has caused a delay, then Obviously, you are going to need to establish that so to be a compensation event, but you're going to have to establish it by reference to your approved program, which is why you need that detail from the consultant um, in your program. So it's it's kind of circular thing, really. Um, next point in terms of um, quality management. So, you know. As we're kind of seeing from this, the clauses are very similar and um, the amendments, or sorry, the differences, not the amendments, the differences between engineering and construction contracts, the contract you'll be familiar with, and the professional services are sort of practical issues. So um, as that first bullet point says, you'll be used to seeing provisions um, that cover testing either off-site, well, off-site and potentially on-site inspection clauses, um, so clauses 41 to 42, 
also searching for and notifying defects, 43. Um, whereas these clauses aren't included under the professional services contract for obvious reasons. Again, it's all around the fact that there's no physical work that has been done by the, the consultant. Um, it's, it's kind of design and advisory work. So then if we move on to um, compensation events, so th the good thing here is that generally speaking, the provisions are very similar. So they're sort of step down. As I've said already, that eight week, um, ho that horrible eight week notification um, under your contracts um, is the same under the professional services contract. Just on that point as well, and I probably say this every week, sorry, every month we do these uh, seminars. Um, typically, if you have any Z clauses in your contract, so amendments to your contract, that eight weeks will typically be reduced for you. So when you're reviewing your contracts, if you are also engaging a consultant on the professional services contract, you need to reflect any reductions in your timescales into um, the professional services contract um, and make it even shorter. So if your timescale is reduced to four weeks, you, know, you probably need to be reducing the professional services contract down to two or three weeks so that, again, you've got time to inform the client within your timescales. <clears throat> so, the requirement to notify compensation events is still the same, um, and also the requirements to for assessing compensation events for the provision of quotes, etc. So all those things that we talk about generally are all the same. Um, where there is a difference is in the number and type of compensation events, and again this kind of primarily fits in with the fact that the consultant isn't on site, isn't doing physical work. So it it sort of makes sense um, for these for these changes um, to be in place. So if we look at so if we look at the examples of the compensation events and how they differ, we've got the engineering and construction contract um, at clause 60.1. So that's your list of the list of most of the compensation events. Don't forget that some of them, some compensation events are included in the X clauses, but most of them are at 60.1. So compensation event number two sits so in, in the brackets is where the client, so in your contracts, that would be your employer, um, doesn't allow access to and use um, of part of the site by the access date. The access date will be set out in the programme. Um, so it's slightly different in the professional services contract. So it's where the client does not allow access to a person, place or thing by the access date. Um, so again, you know, the, the consultant is not going to ever get access as such to the site. So that's the reason um, for those amendments. Um, next bullet point down, both um, include compensation event five, so it's five in brackets, um, that where the client or others do not work within the time shown on the accepted programme or the conditions stated in the scope, um, it's a CE. The engineering and construction contract goes a bit further and includes where the client or others carry out work on the site that's not stated in the scope as being a CE as well. Obviously, it's not needed in the professional services contract because the consultant's not carrying out work. But hopefully that one shows the importance of the accepted programme as between the contractor and the consultant um, but also that the contractor incorporates the consultant's um, programme items into its programme that it will submit up the chain for acceptance by the project manager stroke client. Um, also, professional services contract at compensation event 13 um, states that the consultant corrects a defect um, for which it is not liable under the contract. Um, whereas 
um, and professional services con uh, professional services contract compensation event 14 states that the service manager um, gives an instruction um, correcting information provided the client um, and neither of these compensation events will be familiar as being um, in your construction contracts. So there are a number of compensation events that are in the engineering construction contract but are excluded from the professional services contract and these are typically around the fact that contractor is on site um, doing physical work. So that, that first one, so, uh, compensation event 60.1 number 7, where the project manager gives an instruction for dealing with the historical object, um, object of value, etc. Clearly, you know, that is not going to be relevant to um, the consultant. Um, the next one is item 10, where the supervisor um, instructs the contractor to search for a defect or, uh, sorry, and um, no defects found, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then il number 11, where tests or inspections um, are required to be done by the supervisor. Um, also, one of our favourite compensation events, number 12, which relates to ground conditions, physical conditions. For obvious reasons, that's not um, a compensation event under the um, professional services contract. And also the engineering and construction contract at 13 um, has a weather compensation event, really tricky one to claim under because you require really, really bad weather, uh, not just um, UK um, temperamental weather. Um, again, not a CE under the professional services contract. Um, now, the professional services contract compensation event number 12 um, contains a CE for an event which stops the consultant completing its works and which you know neither party could prevent. So this is pretty much the same as our CE 19, um, which oh, probably about two and a half years ago, none of us had ever looked at, but this is the one where it's effectively a force majeure clause. So it's the one we were looking at um, when um, COVID first struck. Um, it's also one we've looked at in terms of um, the super inflation um, that we're seeing um, in terms of, you know, um, something that we nobody had um, anticipated um, or reasonably expected. Next one is um, compensation event 16. So it's the final bullet point on the slide. Um, so this is just in the engineering and construction contract. So where the client, so the employer, um, doesn't provide um, certain materials, facilities or samples that um, the scope states that it was going to provide for contractor to carry out tests and inspections. So again, pretty obvious why that wouldn't be included in the professional services contract. So the next thing I want to look at is termination. <clears throat> now the provisions um, are pretty much the same except for the compensation due to each party um, on termination. Um, the grounds for termination are pretty much the same. Um, as I say, it's just the compensation that's slightly different. But again, it's reflective of the fact that the, the consultant um, is unlikely to incur certain costs by virtue of the fact that it's not on, the, the consultant isn't based on site in the way that the contractor is. As it says, the final bullet point, um, this next slide sets out a comparison of the sums due on termination as between the two contracts. Um, so the, the first is A1, so it's the amount due on termination. 
um, the red, um, so sorry, the, the middle column is for the engineering and construction contract. So this is what you will be um, relatively familiar with um, in terms of what you will be entitled to in circumstances where um, your client terminates your contract, depending on the grounds. So A1, A2, A3 and A4 um, in the left hand column are all dependent on which grounds um, are um, used um, for termination. So the far right hand column deals with um, the professional services contract and what they're entitled to. So the first line A1, amount due on termination. So the first item is amount um, assessed as for normal payment. So that's in regard to work that's um, being carried out up until the date of termination. That amount is payable for both contracts. That makes sense. Um, the next item only applies for contractors, not for consultants. So it's the defined cost for plant and materials. Plant and materials is basically um, uh, the, the, the um, kind of cranes to carry out the construction and the, the bricks and mortar, um, which are the components that are required. Um, so anything within the working areas or that the client has title to. Um, so for obvious reasons, that doesn't need to be in the professional services contract. The third item um, is the defined cost reasonably incurred in the expect expectation of completing the whole of the works. So that might be, for example, um, costs that the, the contractor has committed to um, to um, complete the work, so fix some subcontractors fees, that kind of thing. Um, and that's also included in the professional services contracts are payable under that as well. Next one, item four, um, is any amounts retained by the client, so retention, etc. Uh, less any amounts to be retained, um, and that applies under the professional services contract. So effectively, that's step down. Um, and finally, for the construction contract only, a deduction of any unrepaid balance um, of an advance payment, which obviously won't apply to the professional services contract because there won't be any advance payments to them. Um, Next one down, A2, um, contract can also claim its forecast cost for removing its equipment from site. Um, and now th this, this is where it sort of gets a bit confusing. Ignore uh, the right hand column far right for the time being. So then we go down to the amount due on termination at A3. Um, so that's um, the third line down. As far as your contracts are concerned, contractors, contracts, um, there's a deduction for the forecast of the additional cost to the client of completing the whole of the service. Now, this is payable where the, sorry, so where the contractor's contract has been terminated because the contractor was in default. Um, in a way which entitles the client, the employer, to terminate its contract. And in that circumstance, the um, client is entitled to deduct an amount, um, so keep an amount aside to allow it to complete um, the balance of the work. Um, and the same applies um, to the professional services contract, but it's at A2 above. So it's the one that says in the second line, um, far right hand side, deduction of the forecast of the additional cost to client of completing the whole of the service. So obviously that's important to um, contractors because if, for example, um, the, the consultant has caused the, the termination um, up the chain, then the contractor will want to recover that from the consultant. So again, in line A3, ignore that far right hand column 
and then we go down to the fourth cop the fourth line so it's a four amount due on termination um so in terms of your construction contracts you get your fee percentage um applied to um whichever contract you're working under um the red um refers to contracts where there's no professional services contract so the black applies to the professional services contracts and um, so it's all um about the overhead and profit for the uncompleted element of the work because bear in mind of course the work's been terminated so it hasn't been completed so this is a sort of loss of opportunity compensation whereby an, an it's payable where again the contract has been so, sorry in this case this one's payable where the termination is either because of a fault or a default um, of the employer or the client or um, it's a termination at will so no default um, at all by the contractor so in that case the contract is entitled to its overhead and profit for the balance of the work that it hasn't been allowed to complete um, and basically um, as it says in the final column see it at A3 above um, so it's effectively um, the same provisions it's just at A3 so it's it all makes sense I think the key thing to remember is um, when you when you if you're ever looking at the different clauses bear in mind that you know if you're looking at claiming under your contract under a4 you're looking at claiming against the consultant under the professional services contract under a3 it's exactly the same provisions um and ditto for a3 under the construction contract as opposed to a2 um under um, the professional services contract because I do think you know if you looked at the professional services contract very quickly you might think right there's no A4 claim here um, but actually there is it's just at A3. So in terms of resolving and avoiding disputes so we're now out of the core clauses and we're into the optional clauses so um the first set of optional clauses we've got a W, so it's W1 um, or W2. They're optional. Typically, you will be dealing with W2 because that's um, based um, on the Housing Grants Construction um, and Regeneration Act applies. W1 is when the Act does not apply. Exactly the same for the professional services contract. So you need so in the contract data of um, the equivalent for the professional services contract, you need to make sure that if you've got whichever W you have in your contract, it's reflected in the professional services contract. Um, so we're looking at NEC4 here which has a new option W, which is W3. Um, so it's included um, in the engineering and construction contract, but not in the professional services contract. So it's, it's the use of dispute avoidance boards. Don't get it muddled with the senior representatives meetings, which are at Ws 1 and 2. Um, this is a dispute avoidance board. It is um, generally for when the Housing Grants Act doesn't apply. Um, so it's really unlikely that you will be using this, um, but it's basically a whole different, it's it's to avoid the parties having to go straight to court in circumstances where, for example, the Housing Grants Act doesn't apply and court is the only option. Um, but bear in mind, if you ever are engaged um, and that W3 applies, you're not going to be able to step that clause down to your professional services contract um, unless you include some bespoke amendments. Moving on to the secondary option clauses. So these are our X clauses. So these are typically um, clauses that you may or may not require to go into the contract or probably more likely the employer, the client may or may not require. 
Um, so you'll get the gist as we go along. But for example, it includes things like liquidated damages. So does the client want that or would they prefer general damages for delay? Um, it includes retention. Yeah, do they want to levy retention? Perhaps yeah, they may not, in which case they won't use that retention clause. First one we want to look at here is option X8, um, which is undertakings to other strange terminology, I think, but it's basically collateral warranties um, and third party rights. So yeah, do we do we have that? Um, in the engineering and construction contract? Absolutely yes. Um, do we have it um, in the professional services contract? <clears throat> yes, we do. Um, other um, secondary option clauses, so other X clauses, so these optional clauses are not included in the professional services contract, but they are included in the construction and engineering contract. So X14, a provision for advance payment for contractors, not, well, actually not hugely used, but interestingly, um, it's being used more and more. So I would say in the last few months, so, you know, just in the last two or three months, I've heard quite a lot of um, talk and debate about using advance payment provisions. So, you know, be prepared for that. I'd, you know, I'd be interested to know if you're um, finding the same. Another one um, that's not included in the professional services contract is X15. So this is um, our critical clause where uh, you as contractor are carrying out design work because this clause says that your design standard is reasonable skill and care and not fitness for purpose and hopefully we all know that we do not want fitness for purpose um, as a design standard. Um, it's wholly inappropriate and um, it's not covered by your professional insurance um, and um, interestingly it's not included um, as an X clause in the professional services contract because the main core clauses include it um, as a requirement, i.e. that any design is to reasonable skill and care. So I think that's a really good argument um, if you're negotiating um, with your client um, or the employer um, that um, all design should, so if there's any design in the contract, this X15 clause must be included, absolutely must. Um, X16 is retention, we all know what that is. Um, and it's not included um, in the professional services contract. It's just not used. Um, and then optional option X17 is damages. So this is a um, fixed amount of damages. So a bit like liquidated damages um, for delay. This is a similar thing, but for low performance. So typically will be used in something like um, a possibly a kind of waste to energy, energy from waste project where, you know, it's got to perform, it's got to um, get the waste through um, the the process at a certain speed and um, certain volumes um, or um, various heating systems or, um, you know, it works where um, it's for a factory, something like that, where, um, you know, typically it's not necessarily so much how it looks but it's how um how the um the, the works perform um in terms of basically making money for the employer stroke client um so not included in the professional services contract and um, other options that are not included in the professional services contract um this new um X21, which is new to um, NEC4, the whole life cost. So this is where, um, as part of the design, um, the contractor suggests to the employer um, some, something that can be done that might actually cost more in terms of build, but um, in terms of whole life cost will prove to be um, very economical. Now, 
I'm not quite sure why that isn't in the professional services contract. And certainly, um, you know, you you might want to consider including it if um, that provision is included in your um, um, engineering and construction contract. Um, and then finally, um, X22, which is this early contractor involvement um, provision, which is only used with options C and E. Um, so again, you know, probably not appropriate um, for the consultants. Um, and then we're going to the schedule of cost components and the shorter schedule of cost components. So bear in mind, what, what do we use these for? We use them for the same thing for both contracts. So if you're on a fixed price contract, um, so options A and B, so that's obviously only option A for the professional services. It's for cost and compensation events only because the fixed price deals with the rest. And um, if you're on option E, um, which applies to both contracts, then it's used for pricing the work um, because that's cost reimbursable. And if you're on um, C and D, so they're the pain gain, the um, target cost contract. So only C applies to the professional services contract. Um, this, um, this is um, the schedule of cost components is relevant only to amending the target cost where the, the nature of the works um, changes and compensation events um, are implemented. So as you'd expect, the bulk of the sec these sections are the same for both contracts, um, except um, that things like, you know, um, items for equipment, plant materials, etc., covered in the construction contract, um, not not so much detail. Um, well, actually, no detail for obvious reasons in the professional services contract. So that's everything for today. So. Amazingly, we've kind of finished in time for questions. Um, so I don't know whether anyone has any questions. There's no questions in the chat, Sarah. So I'm assuming there is there is none, but if anybody does have any questions, if you want to pop those in the chat for us, please. Now, if I move, so as always, you know, what I would say is if you think of any questions through the next week or so, um, my, te my mobile number, my telephone number, my email address are, are all there. So drop me a line and I'm happy to pick them up. The, the charging clock doesn't start to run. So, you know, you won't be charged. Um, but obviously, if it's something that's going to take me hours and hours, I will be coming back to you and telling you that. Um, but feel, yeah, feel free to send queries over if you have any. Perfect. Thank you very much. So thanks, Sarah. Um, and as I mentioned at the beginning of the session, um, future webinars will be moving over to Microsoft Teams. So any that you have already registered for, if you want to just keep an eye out for the new registration link that will be sent in due course. But if that's it from you, Sarah, then uh, we'll say goodbye. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye.